John, del mio tormento. Amor, se coltaccio. Welcome, everyone. Uh, to the return of the College of Berlin Literary Magazine Live Aid. Project a little bit. However, <clears throat> uh, you can give the page number when you read your poem, and then we can all read along. So if we can't hear every word, we can read every word. All right then. So that that little Italian ditty I, I sang. There's a line in there about why my heart lies dormant. I was thinking. You know, our hearts have been a bit dormant uh, because we haven't seen each other enough in person. We haven't had events like this. We've been traversing through the Zoom world. Uh, and then even when we got through the Zoom world, we finally met in class, and then everyone had masks, and I was never quite sure about whether somebody had a mouth or not. <laughs> and then in Zoom, all my students were so small. Uh, you know, they were like this big, on the little boxes. They were like, such small students. So now, the return, uh, with poetry and, uh, and with art, uh, you know, students got to deal with so much. We think we got to deal with a lot of teachers, especially English professors, because they have some new papers to grade, et cetera. Uh, but think of students, you know? As soon as they finish one paper, they've got to do another one. As soon as they finish one quiz or test, they've got to do another one. I mean, they're the embodiment of the challenge or the predicament of Sisyphus pushing the rock up. And they just, what do they do? They just go and they push the rock up again. <laughs> In the midst of all this, what is a, a way of dealing with challenges? Well, for people that have a spark of creativity in them, or we can say a spark of divine fire, uh, they draw from their own inner resources. And that can come out in, in poetry or in art. And we should add that there's some beautiful artwork in here as well as, uh, as fine poetry. And there's been a lot said about poetry as a therapeutic adventure, you know? Uh, and I think it's true uh, that poetry and art have a healing effect, or that they have a healing process. But the healing process is not just therapy for the person that does that. It's also for the person that witnesses it and appreciates it and takes it in. Uh, and, it, and therefore, you, you have poetry, but so many students dealing with so many things in their lives, not just all their papers and their quizzes, but then family things. You know, you can't forget that. Uh, so out of all this, you have student creativity. Uh, and I hope that they just keep that up for the rest of their lives uh, as always an inner resource that they can draw from. No one could ever take that away from you! <laughs> it's your own inner resource that's yours forever and ever. Uh, so you see students then drawing from that inner resource, having a healing process, not just for themselves, but for us, the readers, the viewers, because they touch on a level of feeling that's universal. And Walt Whitman would be it's the universal self. And so you read poems that, that touch on levels of feeling with, with family, with ancestors, with, with people that have passed on, with uh, inner moments within themselves, or with the, the beauties of the planet. Uh, this is also dealing with the, the art that we have. So today's a celebration, uh, not just coming back to having events like this live, but, but also celebration of student creativity uh, and how really amazing and, and impressive it is. And this is spoken by someone who has read a lot, uh, both the so-called great people and the students who are working, uh, developing their creativity. 
Uh, so it's a very impressive collection. Uh, so I say thank you to all of you who have uh, contributed to the magazine, and thank you for all here. And with no more ado, we will uh, start the process of that celebration. It feels really good. 
And once you've done it once, it's a little easier to do it again. So this is a very art-friendly community who have come to hear you read and to, and to see your art. So let's share it with them, share it with them out loud. And please, um, if you're reading a, a, a poem or a, a verbal work out of the magazine, please share the page number so people can look at your text while, they're, while you're reading it. This is informal, so we don't have a list of people who've signed up in a certain order. Um, yeah, we just want to invite anybody who's willing to pop up and, and read. And if we don't, what do you say? I just want to encourage everybody, just, yeah, just come up at random, uh, self-motivated, uh, and just, just do it and, and don't, don't be shy because we all want to hear it. So, uh, first person up. Be brave. <laughs> if you would like your work read and you don't want to be the one to read it, we'll read it for you. Yes. We'd like to hear a lot of this stuff read by the original authors. So, can we get a first go? Who would An like icebreaker. To yeah. yeah, who will be our icebreaker? <laughs> and at the end, we'll have prizes. Yeah. Yeah. If I met myself yesterday, we might be, save for some knowledge on entropy and the orange I had for breakfast. How far would I need to travel to consider myself a new person? A year ago, I wasn't the same as I am today. Does that make us different people? If it's our experiences that make us into who we are, every version of who I've become is a foundation for the next, the same soul eternally evolving. Who knows what the next version will look like? Slowly we grow, like a sapling in the ground. Days turn into nights. Every year adds another ring to our spines.
Take the cool river into your heart, open the door to ether and see into the eye of eternal remembrance. Take the love of truth and never sway, unerring star as stars light onto eternity.
I bet if I wasn't there, Mom would have stayed forever, and that bear would have eaten her. But there I was, scared out of my mind, and that bear had no idea we were there. He is just chowing down on this bush, ripping berries off all at once, and shredding the poor thing. From the middle row, one uncle makes a quiet joke to one cousin. They, are contained, they contain their laughter like an overfull cup, and are destined to grow better. I didn't realize it, but between clinging, clinging to her and clenching my fists in fear, I dug my nails into her butt and snapped her out of it. She looked down at me so disappointed, like I had just ruined the greatest moment of her life. But I'd gotten some sense into her, and she realized that she couldn't get me eaten too, so, no joke, I swear to God, she reaches her arms up like this and roars at the top of her lungs. Jane Drett reenacts this with a sweeping arm motion and a playful roar. That bear's nose nearly plowed up dirt. It ran away so fast. Mom scared it so bad the poor thing didn't even look back, even with the bear gone. Still shaking. I finally get to look around the alcove now and I see every bush torn up and destroyed. That bear had ruined the place. I'm just a kid, terrified out of the pants. Tired, upset, hopeless, and this ruined me too. I broke down in tears and I remember pointing at the thicket he stomped out of and yelling, Curse him, Mom! Use your magic and curse that bear for ruining our berries! She mocks her own child voice, then mocks her mother's with a raspy, crony impersonation. Jen, that's such a silly thing to want. <laughs> <laughs> but I was so upset, I begged and begged, where eventually she gave in, and the story comes to a sour stop. Jane interrupts herself to address the talkers in the middle row. The unbearable talkers, who by now have grown from whisper to conversation. I'd like to remind everyone that this is a funeral. It goes without saying that adults have no problem staying quiet when asked to at a funeral. Even the kids have done a nice job listening, but maybe we all aren't as mature as them. Her criticism gives silence, and the fear that haunted her at the start returns. Realized. Right, Mom, um, I've lost it. I can't remember anymore. Real guys, this isn't a party, and it's not Christmas. Mom is dead, and I shouldn't have to be the one to remind those two to have some fucking respect. The woman spends a second thinking back, but it is hard to remember with frustration on the forefront of her mind. When she returns to the story, Fear is completely cast aside for bitterness. Yet, I begged a lot and cried, and she gave in. I held out my left hand, but she kneels down with me and holds up her right. Jane holds up her right hand, the index and middle finger pointed up, while the rest of the room. I don't know a lot about magic, but she had taught me some right-handed charms. Uh, things like blessings and wishes. These are not curses. Anyways, she grabs my hand, and she grabs the hand I held out and holds it while she can cast. First, she blesses the alcove we're in, then the bushes, asking them to grow back strong and healthy. Then she stares at the path wrecked down by the fleeing bear. To you, you hungry coward, she recites with a rich expression. May you enjoy those berries with a belly so full you have no room left to eat silly little girls who think they own the gifts of God. And she pulled me in, and she hugged me. That was the only time she ever hugged me, and I don't know why. When Dad got better, he took me home, and I never saw her again. I never told him that story either, which is a shame, because he would have loved it. He loved that she was a learner. He loved that she used magic and loved animals. He even once told me how, light, how nice life might be if he could live like her, in the woods with nature. Now please, go back to the bar and think about why he never told you. Jane holds the notes back into her purse. Magnolia in the springtime. 
algae bloom, suffocating your, in, your connectivity to the natural world and living organisms. Blood memory remembers her confusion, the love, the broken promise, his eyes, blue eyes, green eyes, hazel eyes, her duality. Love memory remembers all of this through brown eyes with blue rings. <laughs> but, um, so 42, the next stage, and uh, I think it's going to be a two line thing. So um, it's called Kai to Osh in Da Yogi. He sees me. Kai Willow above the creek. She wiped the kitchen tables as she spoke of contentment by counterlight. 
they knocked gently on our hearts. My mother only gave birth to three, losing the other two. They could not find the shining light through her, and they went back to the dirt under the earth. I see them in my darkest days. One night, I feel a soul choose my friend to be her mother. I will wait till a sense a new day is forming, and there's nothing else to wish for in the world. I went for a walk through eucalyptus trees. I heard a crack, and a branch fell somewhere. Or was that me? I take in the air to fill my body, a new spirit. It gives me new arches in my feet. I kept moving forward and showed me and showed love to someone last night. In an illusion, I see as in an illusion, I see a sea of children playing in a garden, picking flowers, laughing, making decisions with God about who will be their favorite. Saint Nicholas gave them their names in my sleep. A child can be born without my blood. Give it a name, and it will be true. My mother taught me this when she told stories of me being born with no possessions. My days are leaning over newborns. The mother of God knows me by name. Her arms are heavy with bassinets of her juice. I am thirsty for milk. says he knows real magic to make himself disappear. Not the card concealed with a flip and wink and wonder, but the same deck laid out and no one noticed the missing club even though they all play poker on Thursday nights. An empty hat pulled through itself by slight hands and the audience demanded a trick. Where's the trick? But they don't see the smile he had years ago vanished too also. <coughs> Both magician, knife, assistant, and table have and have until he's slim enough to fit through the keyhole of a locked door. I knock on the door, but my question answered with its own echo. This trick isn't the brilliant escape. It's waiting there, tied underwater, until we look away. And suddenly he's not here. But be here, please. Please be here. <laughs> um, so, sorry, page 44. Um, Grandma made 
Daphne. I'm the daughter of Tumbleweed. I was the free standing place resting on the rim of some old wooden slats. I was the young girl who at nine years old won the Galesburg, Illinois boxcar decorating contest. My carriage was loaded with an ebullient array of antique china plates. Mason blue, Canton rose, carnelian, and Eden turquoise. No nails, each one entrusted, delicately resting on rows of thin wooden bars. So much trust. At two o'clock, the freight train rolled in, horn blowing. An endless array of screeching, of metal on metal, forcing a sonar current, a wave of plate shattering energy. There I was, a fragmented nine-year-old girl, bits and pieces of pink and blue, sprawled across a dusty floor. I spent a lifetime trying to put my pieces back together. Chose. 
Nothing got returned, and she never told her mother what she wanted or didn't want. After that, I slowly learned a lot of things about her family. Not because she sat me down and did a lecture or anything, just details I picked up slowly. And I talked to her mom once on the phone. Libby was the only college student to want to talk to her parents all the time. Her mom told her to drop her drawing and painting class, and Libby said she would without asking why. Little things. I know that sounds so stupid. Of course they get a say. They are the ones paying the tuition. I sound paranoid. One day I casually flipped through a pamphlet on controlling relationships. Persuading after someone said no. Convincing a person that not agreeing with them hurt them. Convincing a person that they know better. But I knew I was being irrational. Who didn't have pushy parents? I asked my dad one day. Say my friend seemed to be making all of her decisions off of what her parents wanted. Close, college major, where she'd move after. He said we were both young and still had a lot of growing up to do. If you're thinking now the whole friendship had turned into a weird obsession or endless discussion of her family, these were only a few things that happened over about three years. For the most part, we were regular college friends, just without the alcohol or the boyfriends. I've seen some guys that reminded me why college men are a particularly brand of awful, but the only boyfriend Libby needed was Mr. Darcy. She would have done amazing in another time period, one where it wasn't unusual for women to be controlled by their families. Libby burst into my dorm room one night, truly, unironically squealing. <laughs> there was a new movie based on Pride and Prejudice. This was before streaming services. So she looked up every movie theater nearby and took me to see the movie the day it opened. We both ditched a class and then went to the matinee when students got a discounted rate. Two days later, she needed to see it again, so we went back, this time when we didn't have classes. And back. It was like a little kid with a carousel. She couldn't get enough. And I think between five or six times, I remembered every character's name. She told me I didn't have to come see it every time with her. You didn't have to see it with me every time, she said, as we stepped into the cool Midwestern evening. Sorry, do you want some alone time with Darcy? I could throw a state bomb in the theater and you could plug your nose. I pointed back at the theater. No. No, you did it because you're a great friend. That was definitely a high point. Fine, I will make this quicker. So seven years later, I went to her wedding. We'd written but hadn't seen each other since the last letter I got had a photo of her and her fiancé tucked in. Cliff. I could become a stand-up artist just to make fun of that name. <laughs> yes, fine. So when I got out of the cab and walked in, 20 or so people were standing in a gigantic hall. Ellie, the name-stealing cousin, checked people off on a clipboard. I introduced myself to a couple of men, or more generously put, Vineyard Vine catalog models. One said his name was Cliff, and that he had to leave. That was all I saw of Cliff, and I think all of what Libby saw, too. The whole weekend he wasn't there. Business calls, slept too late. Between the gaggle of Boston cousins, I barely saw Libby alone, either. Then one evening, she had her head in her hands, and when she saw me, she said it was just a headache. Okay, fine, I'll rush this along. <laughs> but I asked her point blank if she loved Cliff, if he was her Darcy. I could gag after saying that out loud. She told me Darcy doesn't exist. Cliff is real. Was I being the jerk here? Maybe I was seeing things that weren't there because of my hatred of the rich. Or envy. Here she was standing in this mile round dress in the middle of Barbie's dream wedding <laughs> while I could barely afford the plane ticket out here. I said she should wait if she wasn't sure she loved him. I said she didn't have to do whatever her parents wanted her to. Again with my parents, she asked. If I was going down, I was going to hit rock bottom. I told her I didn't know how these vain, shallow people could have this amazing, kind, intelligent daughter, but treat her like she's an accessory. I believe when I'm finished with my eulogy, thank you. <laughs> and she said she was sorry. Sorry I have student loans and no boyfriend and my eat the rich attitude hadn't gotten you far. She said she was sorry I had to be the poor friend all these years and that it was apparently all her fault. And I said, let's stop, think, and then Ellie, oh, don't give me that look, walked in. Libby said she wanted me to leave. 
Ellie was closing the door on me as I looked back at Libby for what would be the last time. Staring at the carpet and wiping her eyes off, then she looked up at me. I thought maybe that was my chance that I'd gotten through to her. Then she turned away again. I really wanted to see Libby again, but how do you rebound from that? I was still too stubborn to apologize, and as far as her new life went, old leftist friends from college didn't fit in. So that's where the story technically ends. But I like to think of it as a circle. Corny, I know, but whenever I remember how it ended, I go back to remembering how we met and everything in between. Libby was an amazing person, an amazing friend, and I'm sorry I really couldn't do her justice here. I always hoped that she'd realize she was worth a whole lot more than being a prop for her family. And she did. Two weeks ago, she wrote me for the first time in five years. She asked me for help. She was going to leave Cliff. I am almost done! And she mailed the letter with some bills, pulled out of the parking lot, and got hit instantly. And now we're here. And now I'll leave before you all make me, because I've said my piece. I wanted to tell you all who Libby was, not what you all wanted her to be. Thank you. Now and then, 
water drips from the oak trees, the plunks hearkening to me a dewy revel. Outside, the dimly fogged morning light comes through a monument of windows that frame the grand parental oak trees. Inside, the Danish candles wink at me, and the grandfather clock ticks, and the house sighs. For a moment, no time has passed, no years of loss and wisdom, no churning earth. And for a moment, I am nothing else but home. Thank you. Oh. 